Okay, good morning again, uh, everyone. Um, I hope you're excited this morning to join uh, class um, uh, where you're able to go through uh, what we uh, did on the first class, where you're able to look at your notes, you're able to go through what uh, we did in class one. Yes, no? No response? which means you didn't have the time to go through. Uh, no worries, but it would just be nice if you could, uh, you know, look through your notes, just brush through before you attend the next class. So, uh, you know, if you have any doubts, uh, you can ask. And also there'll be a good connectivity you'll be able to um, understand. Uh, before we begin uh, today's class, can I ask somebody to lead us in prayer, please? Can somebody pray this morning? Anyone would like to lead us in prayer? Okay, thank you. Siddhaku, Robert, you can go ahead. Father, we come to the throne of grace. Thank you for the day, the new days of the world. Lord. Lord, as we are going to study from your word, Lord, whatever we are going to study about your doctrines, Lord, Lord, be with us and Lord, teach us, Lord. We need your wisdom to understand all the, all the things, Lord, all your secrets, Lord. Lord, whatever we will be studying, Lord, it should be stored in our heart and it should be used and should be manifested in our daily lives, Lord. The way we walk, the way we do everything, Lord. Lord, the godly character we should display, oh Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Robert. Okay, so last week, uh, the last, sorry, the last class, uh, uh, we looked at what is theology. We said theology is derived from uh, two words, theos, meaning God, and logia, meaning uh, sayings or utterance. So theology is the study or teaching or the utterance about God. And then we looked at the definition of systematic theology, which is very simple, which basically uh, is the study or the answer to the question, what does the whole Bible teach us about a specific topic? Okay, so any topic or any doctrine you like to study, you know, uh, you look at the entire Bible to see what the entire Bible in its wholeness is talking about that specific topic. Then we looked at uh, what is doctrine. So we basically said um, uh, doctrine is what, uh, you know, is what somebody basically believes, some, something that somebody has believed and understood and uh, taught uh, that to somebody else. And so in systematic theology, doctrine is what the whole Bible teaches us with prayer, with humility, uh, with reason, uh, you know, with help with, from others, and also in praise and in worship. We looked at the prominent uh, biblical doctrines. We just went through that. And then we went on to chapter one, where we studied the doctrine of God, uh, sorry, the doctrine of the word of God. And uh, we said that this phrase, the word of God, has several different meanings in the uh, Bible, and we looked at one uh, 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 meaning, the first one that is the word of God as a person, that is Jesus Christ. So the Bible refers to the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ, as the word of God. And we also saw that the word of God is um, referred to as the speech of God in the Bible. And under this point, the speech of God, we said that it could be a decree of God. A decree is uh, an announcement, a judgment, a declaration that God makes. And we um, uh, also uh, learned that the word of God is powerful. Whatever God decrees, whatever God speaks, whatever God declares, uh, that will come into existence, that will come into being. Uh, so God's word is powerful and the creative words from God is often called God's decrees. And uh, we saw the example in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. The second thing under this point that the word of God is a speech of God. We said that God's 
a word, uh, you know, is uh, a personal address, okay, can also mean God's word can also mean a personal address, uh, which means God is directly communicating to a person, a man or a woman, a child, uh, a, a, a youth, uh, you know, um, he's, he's uh, communicating what he wants to tell them in a way they will understand the language that they will understand. So these are God's word of personal address and we saw one example in uh, Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 to 17 where we saw God speaking to um, Adam and um, Eve and he commanded them that they can eat from any tree uh, in the garden but not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and if they eat from it they will surely die so this is what we um, uh, you know uh, looked at in the first class this is a short recap and uh, now going forward um, the word of God which is also the speech of God uh, can also you know uh, be something that uh, like a personal address when he's giving laws and commandments uh, to his people. Uh, we read in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 3, and God spoke all these words saying, and then he lists out all the commandments to uh, Moses. So this is God speaking the commandments to Moses, um, and, uh, you know, which he passes on to uh, the people of uh, Israel. Okay, so that is uh, God's decrees. The, sec the third thing under God's speech, the first thing we saw was God's decree. Second thing is God's personal address. Uh, the third thing is that God's word as speech is through human lips. Okay, God putting his words in the mouth of his people, which he wants to communicate his message or his laws, his commandments, uh, or what he wants to say, uh, or uh, even his judgments. Uh, he puts his word into the mouths of people. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 to 20, uh, God is saying here that he will raise a prophet uh, and, uh, and he will put his words. And God says, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak all of them uh, that I commit him to speak. Okay, so here God is saying that he will put his words in the, the mouths of the prophets um, uh, that he wants to speak speak through them and uh, he will command them to speak those um, words. Okay, In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, uh, uh, can somebody turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 and somebody else to Numbers chapter 22 verse 38 and can somebody read uh, Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 and somebody else can read uh, Numbers chapter 22 verse 38. Anyone can read Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9? Okay, Jeremiah said, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So Jeremiah here is um, uh, testifying to the fact or he's sharing uh, that, you know, God touched his mouth and God put his words in his mouth. And that is what he is going to share or that is what he's going to tell the people. Numbers chapter 22, verse 38. Has anyone opened to that? Numbers chapter 22, Balaam verse 38. To... And Balaam said to Balak, look... Go ahead, Roslyn. And Balaam said to Balak, Look, I have come to you. Now have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. Thank you. So here, uh, Balaam is saying to Balak uh, that, you know, that he cannot speak anything other than what God has put in his mouth. He says God has already put the words in his mouth. So when he's going to open his mouth, all he can speak is not what Balak is asking him or requesting him or, uh, you know, going to pay him for, but uh, he can only say what uh, uh, God has put in his mouth. So here God's word can also mean uh, speech through human lips, 
uh, God basically putting his words in the mouth of uh, his people that he wants to uh, communicate to others or uh, he wants to pass on to others. The fourth thing is uh, we see uh, in, in, in God's word that God's word is in written form as well. So God's word is in written form in the Bible. Uh, so we are looking at... Um, uh, you know, various um, uh, meanings that God's word means in the Bible. Uh, we said God's word means the speech of God. We may, we said that uh, God's word is, uh, um, you know, um, uh, uh, the person that is Jesus Christ and God's word is also in written form. Okay. So in written form means that God himself uh, is writing uh, the laws uh, we read this in a couple of uh, scripture passages in Exodus. Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. Exodus chapter 32, verse 16. And Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 and 28. In all of these uh, passages, uh, you know, it uh, it's talking about God giving the laws, the commandments to Moses. And um, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, God is, uh, is saying here that, um, you know, uh, we read that after God finishes speaking to um, Moses at Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets uh, of stone written with the finger of God. That means God himself wrote those uh uh, you know, commandments engraved it on the stone. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 16, it says that, um, you know, now the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And in Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 to 28, it says, uh, the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the, the first ones that he had cut. And then he, God says, I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablet which you broke okay so here we see that words of god is also uh, you know a, a, a words that was written by god in written form god himself writing the laws now moses also writes god's word and uh, we read this in deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 9 to 13 and verses 24 to 26. Now, we'll not be able to go through all of the scripture passages in class. I would encourage you to take some time to go through your notes, to look at all these passages so that you can um, be benefited and, uh, you know, learn much better. Okay, the first one is where Moses writes God's word. Second one, we also see that Joshua uh, writes God's word. We read about this in Joshua chapter 24, verse 26. Now, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8, and Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 2, uh, you know, Isaiah and Jeremiah uh, say that, you know, uh, uh, you know, they are being told to write God's word. Now, God tells them, communicates them, uh, you know, what he wants uh, the people to know or what uh, the message that he wants to communicate to the others. And uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah say that, you know, they're being told to write God's word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, Paul is writing the command of the Lord. Paul saying, I'm writing to you the command of the uh, Lord. That means what he has heard, what the Lord has commanded him, that he is um, writing to the church at Corinth. Okay. So even as we see that, you know, Moses, Joshua, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Paul are all writing down what God has communicated to them, you know, uh, we still have to consider these as God's word, even though it has been written by uh, human beings in and in human language okay so it's uh, god communicating through human beings and it is they writing it you know with their own uh, in their own cultural setting their whole historical setting with their own style of writing and in their own human understanding and language but even though we uh, see that it's human writing in their own um, uh, language um, but it is still considered to be God's word. And that is why, uh, you know, we say that uh, the Bible is a divine revelation. Now, what do we learn from all of these points that I've just mentioned is that the Bible is a divine revelation. 
Now, what is revelation? How can you define revelation? Anyone would like to say what is your understanding of revelation? What does revelation mean? Revelation could be what it applies to our life as in God speaks. Okay, um, basically what God is speaking but is re relevant uh, in your life, relevant in your situation, relevant at the point of uh, time of history that you are in. Okay, anyone else? It is an exposure. Uh, you said it's an exposure? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Yes, uh, Sidhu. Ma'am, I think the revel the meaning of revelation, which I think personally is that something which is in secret will, will it is made to made known to us. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, so, yes. Go ahead, uh, Abu. How how do we pronounce your name, Abu Bakr? Bakr. Bakr. Okay, Abu Bakr. Sorry, yes. It's a way of knowing mystery things, to know the mind of God, to know the will of God for our life. Okay, to know the will of God, to know the mind of God. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, some of these things that I'm mentioning in class today is not there in your notes. So if you can just follow in through your notes and you just want to make in your own notes, you're welcome to do so. So... Uh, revelation uh, can be defined as an act of God whereby he discloses, discloses, sorry, he discloses himself or communicates truth to the mind uh, whereby he manifests himself to creation that which could not be known in any other way. I'll just repeat that again. Uh, so revelation is basically an act of God where he discloses himself or communicates the truth to the mind, whereby he makes himself known or he manifests himself. Manifest means he makes himself known to his creation, to his creatures, to humans, that which could not be known in any other way. Now, this revelation uh, may occur in a single instantaneous act or it may extend to a long period of time. Okay, And this communication of him and his truth may be perceived by the human mind in various degrees of full fullness. Okay, So it's not just something that happens at, uh, uh, it can happen just at one instantaneous moment. Uh, but it can also happen through a period of time where God is revealing himself, making known the truths which otherwise is not known. Um, and this is something that can be perceived by the human mind uh, in varying degrees of fullness. Okay. Now, the important emphasis in revelation or this word revelation is that God discloses truth about himself that man would not know uh, otherwise. Okay, so in the broader term of this uh, term, use of this term revelation, it basically signifies that God discloses himself through creation, through history, man's conscience, and through scripture. Okay, so it's given both in event and in word. So event is through history, uh, through his creation, uh, to that how God discloses himself or reveals himself uh, to the conscience of man or it can be even through scripture. So it's given both in event and in word. Okay, So we see that revelation is both general uh, where God is revealing himself through history and through creation or through his nature. And it can also be special where God is revealing himself through his word that is through scripture and through his son so we see revelation is both general and special general because it can uh, god is revealing himself through history god is revealing himself through his nature and it's also special because god is revealing himself through his word scripture and uh, through his son 
Okay, so that is why we say that Bible is of a divine origin or it's a divine revelation, even though it's uh, written uh, by humans, their own way of understanding and through their language. Okay, now we see that um, the Bible is uh, has a divine origin, uh, you know, some 3800 times in the Bible. Uh, it declares God said, or thus says the Lord. So there's some 3,800 times in the Bible uh, where there is a declaration that says God said, or thus says the Lord. And there are various scripture passages that prove this. Um, and the Bible we see that was, was written by 40 different authors through a varied period of time, that is 1,500 years, in different locations, under various different circumstances, um, uh, by different people who never even met each other, because they said it is through a period of time that is more than uh, 1,500 years. And uh, But we see that irrespective of uh, this time span and 40 different uh, authors who wrote at different uh, times in, in history, some never even met each other, but yet we see that, you know, the, uh, the Bible is one whole, it's a unified whole, okay? There are no contradictions, there are no inconsistencies within its pages. And uh, so how can we explain this? How can we say that even though the uh, Bible was written by 40 different authors through a whole time span of uh, uh, 1,500 years in different points in history, different circumstances, different situations, uh, yet there is no contradictions, there is no inconsistencies, it is one unified whole. Now, how can we explain this? Anyone would like to answer? How can we explain this? Who do you think is the main author then? Holy Spirit. Thank you, Paul. It's uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit uh, is the unifier of the 66 uh, books uh, uh, and he determines the harmonious consistency and the unified wholeness that is there in the uh, Bible. So it's apparent that no human being or no human beings could have orchestrated this harmony, uh, this perfect unity that is there running through the entire scripture, uh, but it's the divine authority or it's the divine authorship of the Bible uh, that is the Holy Spirit, which is the answer to it being one unified whole, okay? So even though the Bible is God's word, God's own words written down mostly by human beings in human language, uh, but it is absolutely authoritative. Now, what do I mean when I say it's absolutely authoritative? It's reliable and it's trustworthy and it's absolutely true. Why? Because it is inspired by God or it's, it's God breathed. And how do we know this? Which scripture reference uh, says that God's word is inspired or God breathed? Second Timothy 3.16. Thank you, John. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given uh, by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So here you see that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, inspiration is very, very necessary to preserve the revelation of God. Okay, if God has revealed himself, uh, but this record of that revelation is not accurately recorded, then the revelation of God is subject to question. Okay, so why, why are we saying that, uh, you know, uh, it's not a recorded 
Exactly, because it is through uh, human beings. It is how the human, the, the person has understood, has perceived it, and how the person is writing. So we're saying that, you know, uh, inspiration is very, very necessary because even though it is, uh, uh, the, uh, the Bible has the word of God, it's a revelation of God. And if this, uh, uh, if God has revealed himself, but this record of this revelation is not accurately recorded, then this revelation of God is subject to question. And so inspiration is very, very important. When you're talking about inspiration, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, you know, um, uh, inspiring the authors to write exactly what they heard or what God revealed to them. So hence, we see that inspiration guarantees the accuracy of the revelation that is written uh, by you by humans through their their hands okay so what is inspiration okay inspiration can be defined as the holy spirit superintending that means the holy spirit directing the holy spirit controlling uh, uh, or having a control over the writers so that while they are writing or recording what they heard what god revealed to them in their own style their own personalities, the result was exactly what God had revealed to them. It was God's word written uh, or God's word revealed to them exactly. And hence, it is authoritative. Hence, it is trustworthy and it's free from error, uh, from any kind of error in the original autographs. Okay. Any questions thus far? Any doubts, anything you all didn't understand, you want me to explain again? No, ma'am. Okay. So just say that again. Uh, we're saying that, uh, you know, um, God revealed, um, you know, or made known things that was not formally known to people. And he reveals things that he wants his people to know. And he does this through human beings and so when god reveals it it's actually and he's telling them to write it down it's the human uh, being with their own personality their style and what they've understood and what they've perceived they're writing god's revelation now if they uh, if they write it and um, you know the record of that revelation is uh, is not accurately recorded then you know the whole revelation of god or the whole bible is subject to a uh, question or to doubt Okay, so we see that inspiration guarantees the accuracy of the revelation. And we said that inspiration is basically uh, the Holy Spirit superintending, that means directing, controlling, or having a control over the writers so that they're exactly recording or writing what God has revealed to them, even though they're writing it in their own uh style and personality the result is god's word that is written which is authoritative which is um, trustworthy uh, and which is free from any kind of error okay so this brings us uh, to this whole uh, to the uh, to the next topic of canon okay the canonization of uh, scripture Okay, I'll explain to you what is the meaning of canon or canon and what is the meaning of canonization of scripture. Okay, so if uh, the scripture is uh, inspired by God, um, you know, then a significant question arises, uh, which books are inspired and which books are not inspired. Okay, so how do we know that all of the 66 books in the Bible are actually inspired by God? Um, and it's written by authors who have received the revelation and have been inspired by God, or that means the Holy Spirit has enabled them. Why are the other books that were written during this time, why are they not in the uh, Bible? So who made the decision? What was the uh, you know criteria used to see whether all of these 66 books should be in the Bible or not? Okay, so we look at that in the canon of Scripture. Okay, so historically, uh, it's important for the people of God to determine which books God had inspired and uh, which were recognized as authoritative. Now, uh, this 
all this thing brought about the canonization of scripture now this word canon is used to describe the inspired books uh, this word uh, comes from the greek which is canon k a n o n uh, or also from the hebrew word which is kana which is q a n a h which is basically meaning a measuring rod okay or a measuring stick uh, in terms that canon and canonical thus came to signify the standards by which uh, you know certain book the books of the bible were measured uh, to determine whether or not they were inspired by god and if they should be in the bible so basically it's like a measuring stick or a ruler that we uh use you know to uh measure something uh to find the accuracy of it and so this whole canonization of scripture came about um uh to just uh you know bring about a measuring stick a a a standard to use to see which books should be in the bible and which shouldn't um uh, be okay um so we see that even though these uh, things were um, uh, set up by people the canonization of scripture it is not the religious councils not at any point of time uh, it was not the re religious councils that had the power uh, to determine which books should be in the bible which shouldn't be which books were inspired and which books were not uh, rather it simply recognized that within that within god what god had inspired what the exact moment it was written by the authors so how can we say that uh, you know uh, they knew which was inspired or not because uh, uh, these books were already recognized as authoritative uh, why because it was spoken through prophets uh, it was spoken through people whom at that point a time in history uh, the people around them recognize these people as uh, prophets recognize them as priests recognize them as scribes or people who uh, you know god revealed through them okay so even as these uh, people wrote the authors in the bible wrote uh, uh, they were already considered as authoritative the words were considered as authoritative because the people around them already recognized them as authoritative figures because they knew that god was speaking to them because what they were speaking came about uh you know uh, they heard god speaking to them uh, they knew that god had chosen them as leaders as prophets and as priests so these books were already recognized as inspired uh, by god because it was spoken through his people that he had chosen uh, and it was not by some religious councils that came up later uh, who sat down and uh, you know put things into shape or form to determine which books were inspired or not so we cannot say that even though that there were some religious councils that met at uh, nicaea at constant constantinople and all of those places um you know uh, though these councils happened but these councils really did not determine uh, you know which are the books that needs to go in the uh, bible so it's the jews the early jews and the uh, you know traditional christians uh, that recognized the 39 books of the old uh testament uh, as inspired and it was the evangelical protestants that recognized the 27 books of the new testament as um inspired okay so it was uh, uh, these books were considered as inspired not based on some religious councils that met and uh, you know put down a measuring stick or a measuring rod to measure which was inspired or not but it was um, already recognized as inspired word of god inspired scripture uh, by the people uh, in that in that time of history because they recognized these prophets uh, uh, their priests or their leaders as god chosen and hence they speaking god's word or god communicating through them and uh, uh, you know they teaching the people of uh, israel or the people who were there at that time any questions so far any questions uh one question uh, pastor 
so uh, why is it that we uh, maybe through the traditions that we have learned we have heard the nicean uh, another council came up and they decided on uh, is that can you hear me yeah a little a little better okay uh so my question was why uh through the history that we have learned that uh, it was through a council is it um was there a council uh, for the determination of canon or um is it uh, is it inspired only through god um so we're saying that um you know uh, yes there were people who came uh, came around uh, uh, you know to um, uh, to consider uh, you know which books were uh, inspired which books were not but i'm not i'm saying that it was not they who determined whether it was uh, you know um, a kind of uh, uh, inspired books because they already considered it as inspired books because of the person who was speaking and the people at that time who recognized uh, uh you know um, that they were uh, uh, prophets or teachers or uh, scribes or priests and so it was already uh, considered as authoritative they just you know took it and uh, you know just just determined that these are the books that were there uh, as a unified whole in the bible uh if you if you go through uh, the o- old testament canon and uh, the new testament canon and we will see the criteria then you'll uh, to see that you know which were the books that were inspired which books were considered to be in the bible which books were not and why they were not considered then you'll have a better understanding uh, sure thank you yeah. uh, so what we are saying really is that the religious councils at no point of time had the any power to cause books to be inspired okay like there are other uh, books that are not included in the bible okay uh, they could have chosen those books and said those books are inspired by god and brought in the bible but these councils uh, 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 you know had no power or had uh, you know at any point of time to cause books to be inspired that is what we are saying did you understand now yes pastor thank you so they had no power to cause books to be inspired they already considered the books that were inspired to be part of the bible uh, because of uh, what i said you know they were taught by uh, uh, people uh, who were prophets and priests and uh, and teachers and the people around them already had acknowledged them as leaders as men a uh, uh, women of god and uh, you know and hence uh, they were declaring the revelation of god and hence that whole thing that they had written was inspired by god if yes, somebody else had a question yeah can i ask yeah sure yeah um still about this uh, religious council how was this co- constituted uh, by who was this uh, councils constituted Okay so these religious councils basically came up at different times uh, or different points in history um uh, to uh, confront or uh, you know the false teachings or uh, false declarations that were made uh, against um, uh, you know uh, uh, the bible or against teachings of the bible uh, doctrines that were uh, uh, false doctrines so these various councils came about at various point of time in history to defend the truth in god's word uh, or to defend uh, the right theology uh, even about the son of god and uh, hence these councils came about and that's when they made uh, creeds like the nicene creed the apostolic creed and all of those creeds they made it just to uh, you know uh, to consolidate or uh, uh, to uh, to lay down basic uh, truths that uh, we as christians believe which are against the wrong teachings or the false doctrines that were Uh, prevalent at that time did i answer your question yeah i think i'm okay with that thank you 
Okay, thank you. So we look at uh, the Old Testament, uh, how uh, the canonization of the Old Testament, uh, basically how the books in the Old Testament uh, came into being, how it was formulated, and uh, what was the criteria used uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, see whether these books were inspired and whether they should be in the Bible. Now, the earliest collections of the written word of God uh, is the Ten Commandments. And we know that it was, uh, and I just said earlier in the class, that it was written by God himself with the finger of God. Okay. And these two tablets that God gave Moses, he uh, was put in the Ark of the um, Covenant. We read this in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 5. Um, and we see that, you know, uh, this was the first basic writing and uh, there was more added to this two tablets. Uh, so Moses wrote additional words uh, and he asked uh, the priest to deposit it beside the Ark of the Covenant. We read this in Deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 24 to 26, it says that when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, uh, when he had finished it, Moses commanded the Levites uh, who bore the Ark of the Covenant saying, take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there as a witness against you. So we see that, um, of course, God wrote those two tablets. They put it in the Ark of the Covenant. And then um, there were not just 10 commandments that God gave um, Moses, uh, uh, you know, it says that there are 613 laws uh, that God gave Moses, which he wrote them all down. And he gave it to the priest to keep it beside the Ark of the Covenant. Now to this, uh, Joshua added, uh, we read this in Joshua chapter 24, verse 26. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. So he adds more. Uh, now God had earlier given a command to, uh, to Moses that you shall not add uh, to the word which I command you nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So now for Joshua to add to what Moses had written, uh, you know, it, he should have been convinced that uh, he was not taking it upon himself to write something that he thought he heard or he wanted to write, but it was the very words of God and God himself authorizing him to write it. Now, later, after Moses wrote and Joshua wrote, then we see that um, the, there were others uh, who, uh, you know, uh, were in the office of a prophet uh, or a priest or a leader. Uh, they wrote down additional words uh, that they received from God and it was added in. Uh, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25, that, uh, you know, Samuel writes down the right and the duties of kingship and we see that every king when he comes into his uh, position as a king is supposed to read all of these rules and laws and the things that he has to do as a king okay in second chronicles chapter 26 verse 22 uh, we see a reference to isaiah writing about uzziah so we see that more and more people were adding to the content that was already there. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 2, God instructing Jeremiah to write down his words. And I said earlier also that uh, God tells um, Isaiah to write down what he has spoken to uh, him. Okay, So we see this way the content of the Old Testament canon uh, continued to grow till the end of the writing process with the book of uh, Malachi, which is around uh, 435 BC. Okay, uh, we'll just end this class by, uh, by just, I just list out, it's not there in your notes, so you can take it down if you want. Just uh, some specific tests that were considered, uh, you know, which book should be in the Old Testament uh, or the, the canonical books of the Old Testament. The first thing they looked at was, did the book indicate divine authorship? Okay, was the person chosen by God uh, as a priest, as a prophet, as a leader? The second thing is, did it reflect God speaking through a 
mediator. You know, that's why I said people recognized them because they, they knew that God was speaking to this person. So they did reflect God speaking through a mediator. The third thing was, is that was the human author, a spokesman of God. Okay. Uh, did God choose him? Was he speaking for God? Was God revealing things through him? The next thing is, was he a prophet or did he have the prophetic gift okay that's quite evident because uh, when they speak uh, you know god's word is powerful is creative i said in the beginning and yet last class as well that you know it happens whatever god speaks it happens so people were able to see it and testify yes this is a prophet uh, is god's and this is a man uh, that god is speaking true the next next thing is was the book historically accurate now when writing all of these uh, uh, revelations or these people were recording it where uh, there is that historical accuracy the next thing is, did it reflect a record of actual facts? Okay, did it record the actual facts, the actual events that were happening at that time? The last thing is, how was the book received by the Jews? Or how was this book received by the people? I'll repeat that again. Uh, what were the specific tests to consider the canonicity of the books of the Old Testament? The first thing is, did the book indicate divine authorship? The second thing is, did it reflect God speaking to a mediator? The third was the human author, a spokesman of God. The fourth is, was he a prophet or did he have a prophetic gift? The fifth was, was the book historically accurate? The sixth, did it reflect a record of actual facts? The seventh is, how was the book received by the Jews? Okay. So these are the seven things um, that were used to uh, uh, determine the inspiration or uh, the accuracy of uh, the books in the Old Testament. And uh, so in summary, the books of the Old Testament were divinely inspired and considered as authoritative the moment they were written, the moment that it was written. Why? Because the people at that time recognized the writers as spokesmen of God or somebody who was a prophet, somebody who God spoke through. Okay. So finally, there was a collection of these books uh, into a canon. Um, and um, the Jewish literature that was prevalent around this time, outside the Old Testament, the rabbinical literature, and other Jewish historians uh, at that point of time testify to the fact that there is no more writings uh, you know, that are treated as the word of God after 435 BC. So it was not just the people at that time, but also people who wrote many Jewish literature uh, uh, outside the Old Testament, that is uh, not there in the Old Testament books, rabbinical literature written by rabbis, and also Jewish historians who are living at that time, they testify to this fact that there are no more books that were written that were considered to be inspired that had to be uh, in the uh, Bible after 435 BC. Okay, I'll stop here. Any questions? Was it clear? Were you able to understand? Yes, no. Yeah, you have a question. Yes, Pastor. Okay, go ahead, John. You have to say something. I was saying it is clear. Oh. Okay. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, sorry for the delay in starting today's class. Um, have a, a good day and a blessed weekend, and I'll see you next week. And please take some time to read your notes uh, so that if you have any doubts, um, you can ask that next class. Okay, thank you, everyone. See you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.